This is CBC Here and Now. Every business I talk to is growing because a lot of people in this area, it's, it's, it's their communities. Don't call it a downturn. The economy may be on the skids, but retail development is red hot. St. John's business owners share their secrets. Good evening, I'm Jeremy Eaton. And I'm Anthony Germain. Well, you see them all over town, cranes, dump trucks and excavators. Construction around the city is in full swing, and a lot of that is new retail space. All this comes at a time when the province is supposedly mired in an economic downturn. Here now's Ryan Cook has more. If the economy is in a downturn, Vic Lawler doesn't really care. In just five years, he's built up Rope Block Plaza from a retail wasteland to a jam-packed strip mall. Now he's got two more big franchises moving in on Cash and Avenue. So what's his secret? Once the economy drops a bit, it sort of like becomes a fire sale for everyone. But on the positive side of it, it's a great development time because costs are usually down 20, 30 percent on the construction side. All over the Northeast Avalon, new retail spaces are popping up. $25 million for a new shopping center in Paradise, more than $50 million for a massive overhaul of the Avalon Mall in St. John's. Then there's new additions to community-centered strip malls like Ropewalk Lane, the Torbay Road Mall and Churchill Square. It all comes at a time when the unemployment rate in the province is rising, but retail spending has never been higher, topping $9 billion last year. In Churchill Square, Evan Bercy is breathing a sigh of relief as businesses move into long vacant spaces. There's also a proposal for a new condo building with six stories and 78 units. A rising tide raises all ships, so I think it's a really good thing. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, positivity on the horizon here between the various food establishments that are coming here. Uh, we have the, the apartment building that's coming in and everybody's moving in over there across the way. So it's really uh, definitely promising times for Churchill Square. The economy isn't doom and gloom for downtown's Rocket Bakery either. Owner Kelly Mansell has plans for a new satellite location in Churchill Square, expanding in a citywide market already full of coffee shops. In the wintertime here in St. John's, the number of tourists drops and, and things get quieter. And we have a staff of 45 people and we want to keep them working to, at full capacity. So um, opening another outlet just really made sense for us. Mansell says community has been the key to Rocket's growth and she wants to help do the same for Churchill Square. In Ropewalk Lane, there's little room left to grow. Vic Lawler has big deals on the horizon, but this place will always be a special success story for him. The local tenants love it because they, they get the business from the traffic from the national tenants. They do well. I keep the rates low. I'm probably the lowest rates in the city. Uh, like my mindset is build a good community and they'll stay forever. Forever is a long time, but if this trend in retail spending keeps up, communities will keep growing their retail spaces. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. A fiery three-vehicle crash has claimed the life of a 14-month-old girl. The accident happened just before 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon at the intersection of Robert E. Howlett Memorial Drive and Ruby Line in St. John's. Police say the SUV carrying the toddler hit another SUV, which then hit a car. Seven other people were sent to hospital, including the driver of the second vehicle, who remains in serious condition. The investigation into the cause of the crash is ongoing. Police are looking for witnesses as well as anyone who may have dash cam footage. This large Dodge pickup sits upside down on the side of the highway today just north of Deer Lake. A male driver hydroplaned and flipped his big rig around 730 this morning. Heavy rains left a lot of water on the roads. The RCMP and Deer Lake say the man got out unscathed and then hitched a ride home with someone else passing by. When police got to the scene, the driver had already left. A 48-year-old man is in custody tonight following a shooting in Hatchet Cove, just southeast of Clarenville. It happened over the weekend. Harvey Price faces a long list of charges, including careless use of a firearm and uttering death threats. Sources tell CBC that Sunday's shooting stemmed from a family dispute and two men narrowly avoided being shot. This isn't Price's first brush with the law either. He's been convicted twice for animal cruelty, the latest in 2013 when the SPCA seized a malnourished dog from his property and that animal had to be put to death.
Since 2013, Brad Summers has flown under the radar. Five years ago, the alleged Hells Angel associate made headlines with a firebombing, a drive-by shooting, and an arrest. But as here and now, as Arianna Kelland reports, Summers is once again in the spotlight, this time as the target of an alleged murder plot. July 2013, Brad Summers was led into provincial court in St. John's. A noticeable crest blazing on his shirt, Hells Angels insignia. Summers was picked up with now accused killer Al Potter, charged with violent assaults near George Street that police said were connected to outlaw gangs. His arrest came at a tumultuous time in St. John's. Summers and Potter's home was firebombed on Hamilton Avenue. Then later that same night, a home in Kemount Terrace was targeted during a drive-by shooting. It was a terrible case of mistaken identity. Wrong home, wrong family. A suspected case of retaliation all the same. To date, no one has ever been charged. Now, five years later, the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit say four men plotted to kill Summers and have been picked up in a drug and weapon sting dubbed Operation B Tarantula. Why they would want to kill Summers and how they allegedly plan to do it are unknown. As for Summers himself, he too is facing charges for break and enter and carrying a loaded handgun. The men accused of trying to kill him have court appearances scheduled for this month. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. I knew that down the road sometime that this was going to happen again, and of course it has. As the province grapples with four recent inmate deaths, a Newfoundland father wonders what happened to the report into his son's 2008 death. That story coming up on Here and Now. Well, a brief but powerful storm blew through Happy Valley Goose Bay this afternoon, knocking down trees, as you see there, in one neighborhood. This was the scene on Palliser Crescent just this afternoon. Crews clearing away those trees. The storm didn't last long, just about 10 minutes of blustery weather, but that's pretty much all that it took. Bit of work to do. Some trees to cut, some... Yep. Maybe some firewood. That's what I was thinking, the same thing. Oops. Can you burn this? Yeah, well, well you got to let it dry a bit. All right. <laughs> it was but, raining. Uh, that is true. That's, that's true. true. <laughs> we'll to hey, so let's, uh, let's, bring, let's bring in Carolyn Stokes. Yeah, yeah so, so actually, I was talking to Environment Canada about this uh, earlier today, and they told me that there were actually gusts up to 93 kilometers an hour yeah, around that time period. So that's what, uh, what caused that damage there. Okay. So, yeah, it's pretty blustery there in Labrador this evening, and it's going to stay that way along the coast. Let's uh, have a look at those winds gusts uh, overnight tonight. So it's actually kind of breezy uh, in St. John's today with gusts up to 60 at the moment and some rain coming through. But you can see those high winds for Happy Valley Goose Bay, Makovic. And as we work through the evening, it starts to subside a bit in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but stays fairly strong throughout the night uh, along the coast of Labrador. So we are switching to this northwesterly wind. So that means we're getting a bit of a cool down. Uh, not too, too bad, but it, it is going to definitely cool down a bit. And we're looking at sunshine pretty much across the board for the province uh, tomorrow, but it will start off pretty cool. And then tomorrow night, we're looking at some showers, mostly for Labrador and for the western portion of the island. I'll have all of those details coming up a bit later. You can see heavy rain and crashing waves hit western Japan as Typhoon Jebi slammed into its Pacific coast, disrupting train service and air travel. The storm, with sustained wind gusts of up to 250 kilometers an hour, may become the strongest typhoon to smash the country over the past 25 years. More than 300,000 people are under evacuation advisories as the country braces for flooding and landslides as well. Over 700 flights were canceled and the high-speed bullet train service from Tokyo to Hiroshima, well, that had to be suspended. People living along the U.S. Gulf Coast are bracing for tropical storm Gordon. Outer bands of the storm have already hit Florida. Winds are expected to pick up and Gordon will likely become a hurricane before making landfall tonight in Louisiana, Mississippi or Alabama. 
Storm surge and flash flood warnings are in effect all along the coast, and states of emergency have already been declared in Louisiana and Mississippi. The family of a student who died suddenly at Munn last year has created a scholarship in her honor. 18-year-old Alex Kirkland was a second-year student, and she died last October from complications brought on by an irregular heartbeat. Her family flew down from Ontario over the weekend to plant some of her ashes beneath a blue spruce street near residence where she was president. Kirkland's parents say the award will support community leaders like their daughter. Affordable and predictable electricity rates in the Muskrat Falls era. Premier Dwight Ball has pledged to make that happen, but has offered no plan on how he will keep that promise. But at least one energy policy researcher with close ties to the Liberal Party believes that is achievable. Former MHA Danny Dumbresk says a lot of options are on the table and that Ottawa is the key to the plan. Here and now is Terry Roberts reports. It's not going to be easy, uh, but there's every reason to believe that we can uh, uh, get through this. The struggle to pay off Muskrat Falls begins in 2021. More than 800 million annually to finance the debt. There will be millions from electricity sales and cheap recall power from the Upper Churchill, but that still leaves a gap of hundreds of millions of dollars. Danny Dumaresk says the federal government can help bridge that gap. First, by changing the terms of the federal loan guarantee to allow oil revenue from Newfoundland's offshore to help pay for Muskrat. One energy project uh, will uh, uh, should uh, contribute to the financing of the other energy project. That will leave a hole in the province's finances, but Dumaresk says there's no other choice. If we have to uh, take the oil money and uh, put it into making sure that uh, all of our most vulnerable people don't have to make the choice between the food on the table and the thermostat, then I think we're spending money wisely. Then there's Hibernia. Ottawa owns an 8.5% equity stake, profiting $75 million last year alone. Dumaresk says that equity should be turned over to the province. The people of Canada, I, th I think, would uh, accept that the government of Canada would uh, now, at a time of uh, such dire need financially in this province, that that would be one place they could look. Dumaresk says Ottawa should also be lobbied to purchase an equity stake in Muskrat, much like it did with Hibernia and finance a new transmission line through Quebec to allow Labrador power to reach new markets. And further down the road, Dumaref says, there's the much-hyped prospect of a new contract with Hydro-Quebec for the sale of massive quantities of power from the iconic Upper Churchill. He sees a realistic scenario whereby a new contract is reached that sees power from the Upper Churchill, Muskrat Falls, and the as-yet-developed Gull Island project wheeled through Quebec and returning a hefty and steady stream of revenue to the province. Do it in, like, the grand plan. And finally, the province has more than $3 billion in equity in Muskrat Falls. Dumaresk says the province must forgo any returns on this equity. If you combine those uh, uh, various revenue streams, along with, uh, the, the, uh, hopefully, uh, the flexibility from uh, Ottawa to, uh, uh, to fine-tune some things, uh, I think we do have a, a feasible uh, possibility of meeting uh, the, uh, I think, the, the very desirable objective of... Uh, of uh, the Premier. If this matches the province's strategy, Dwight Ball is not saying. So that's work that's ongoing. We've got quite a few people involved in all of that, and we're looking at a number of options. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. And here is a live look right now of the harbor from our room's camera. Doesn't look too bad. No. Karen will be back in a bit just to let you know what you can expect as far as the weather goes. That's next.
not that heavy. No. You just lay it right on there. Perfect. This is sugar syrup. Uh, it's it's one part water, one part sugar. 50-50. And why are you doing this? This is, uh, the bees will take this as nectar and it helps them to build out their comb. Here it's nice and slow. Nice and slow. There they are. They're all looking Ooh. up saying, we're home. Once the bees are really comfortable with this location, we're going to take your hive, the actual hive you've been painting, and we're going to actually move this one to the side and we're going to put your hive in its place and we're going to start slowly taking one frame at a time and, and putting it uh, back into the new hive. Hi guys, welcome home. They're just kind of peeking around. I wouldn't go any closer than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I didn't think we were coming Don't back. Get too close. That was pretty fun. Yes. So you were just wondering that was not an infomercial. This yeah. is a bee update. That's a bee update. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they uh, they returned this morning at around quarter to seven. Uh, Paul Din, you saw there talking from Adelaide Honey yep. and his interns, uh, Travis and Amy, they brought the bees back. So if you're familiar with the story, we found the bees in my house there a few weeks ago and I decided to become a beekeeper. Yeah. So and you got the hive awesome. going. Had the, the hive going. So we're going to transplant them into a different hive uh, in about a week from now. So right. once they get sort of settled and get used to the surroundings again, then right. we're going to move them into. And in a blatant act of insider trading, I've bought all the shares in <laughs> Carolyn's company. <laughs> Gone. Don't bother. You got to get in early, right? I was also going to ask a selfish question. When can we expect honey from the hive? Oh, no. They need every bit of honey now for the winter because the bees will start survive the entire winter in case you don't know an interesting fact about bees they will actually survive the whole winter inside mm. the hive so I have a feeling we're gonna get a lot of bee trivia over the next <laughs> year in a bit yeah but it's all good it's well, all good we learned I've, yeah. I've learned a lot tonight already <laughs> sorry <laughs> now I can we help myself I'm no, fascinated it's, yeah. and it's a great story <laughs> but can the people at home learn a bit more about the weather the weather yeah uh, we have some Cooler, kind of cooler temperatures on the way. We have a northwesterly wind that will be cooling things down just a little bit. So if you're in St. John's, you might notice that there's some showers happening uh, right now. That is going to be clearing away. But to start, here's a look at our highs today. So it got up to about 20 degrees in St. John's, 24 in central areas, and uh, mid-teens in most of Labrador, 21 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Not a bad day there. But we do have some showers for Labrador tonight. And here are those showers uh, that are affecting the Avalon Peninsula right now, but you can see they will quickly be moving off by about 11 o'clock. Things should clear off uh, tonight. We're looking at some fairly cool temperatures overnight, though. So those showers, they're clearing as well for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay and for parts of Labrador, but we do have a risk of frost for Lab West and for the Nain area tonight, so take note of that. T overnight lows looking about four or five degrees there, so pretty chilly, and that's because of this northwesterly wind that's coming through. Pretty strong winds as we saw earlier for the coast of Labrador overnight tonight and fairly strong as well for eastern Newfoundland. So tomorrow morning, these are the temperatures you'll see when you're heading out the door. You're going to want a jacket for sure. Temperatures in the low teens for most of the island. Four degrees for eastern and western Labrador, but lots of sunshine. You can see not much by way of overcast or clouds in the sky. Clouding over, though, in the afternoon for western Labrador. Some showers on the way there. So these are your temperatures for tomorrow. Doesn't look too bad. 19 degrees as the high for St. John's. But for the morning and early afternoon, things are going to stay fairly cool in that uh, northwesterly wind. So, yeah, you probably will want a jacket tomorrow, even though we're heading up to 19 degrees later in the afternoon. Similar story for central areas of the island and 16 degrees as the high for Corner Brook tomorrow. Lots of sunshine for everyone to enjoy as we head up north. Things cooling down a little bit, but you can see those uh, northwesterly winds really affecting uh, the coast there. 12, 13 degrees and uh, for Labrador City, 14 degrees and a mix of sun and cloud with some showers moving in later on that evening. And I'll have those details a little bit later. Anthony? It's a story that we've been reporting on for months. Four inmates in the province dead, all in the span of one year. But before that, there was Austin Aylward Jr. His death one decade ago at Her Majesty's Penitentiary resulted in a government ordered review. Tonight, his father says that that review was nothing more than a document to appease the family and bolster the public's view of the governing Tories at the time. He says the recent deaths of four more inmates 
is a tragic case of deja vu. Ariana Kellen reports. My son was absolutely fabulous. It was, uh, it was nobody, a father or mother, could ask for a better son than Austin was. Austin Aylward Jr.'s life ended during a downward spiral more than a decade in the making. He was the driver of this vehicle, an 18-year-old who was going too fast. His friend died in the crash, sparking what would be a series of trips for Aylward to the penitentiary and the Waterford Hospital. We absolutely ran out of anything that we could do until finally, and we pleaded with people that, you know, things are going to uh, no doubt get worse, but, and they did, and unfortunately it ended up the way it did. On March 22, 2008, Aylward died of a seizure, alone in his cell at HMP. His parents had pleaded with lawyers not to send him there. He was too mentally ill. No one listened. They just told me, uh, your son has died. Uh, so I, I just went blank, absolutely blank at the time. I didn't find any compassion. Or, it took us a couple of days after to really get some in, news or some information on about what happened. And just like these recent four jail deaths, the government of the day ordered a review. Retired Supreme Court Justice Robert Wells came back with these recommendations, among them that a new penitentiary have a mental health wing and that all correctional institutions have a mental health facility nearby. It's just put on the, on the back burner on the shelf. It was just to appease the public and my family at the same time. Uh, I don't believe right from the beginning there was any intent to do anything about it because after that was done, it was uh, shelved and nobody else mentioned it. Uh, no government member ever mentioned it. It was just passed out to me and presented to the government and forgot about as fast as that. The review provided a glimmer of hope where Aylward Sr. says there was none. It came at a time when the price of oil was high and the government was flush with money. But Aylward says his now broken family was forgotten. The thing about that is that uh, also I had a daughter who was correctional officer at the penitentiary at the time. There was no help for her, no help for my family. And I'm telling the people that who have lost loved ones there to expect the same. Today, Aylward Sr. is living provinces away. He wishes he had sound advice for the families his heart has been breaking for. I had to carry on with my life. I was not in the mood to fight anymore about it. But absolutely, I knew that down the road sometime that this was going to happen again. And of course it has. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. A locally owned and operated business is still thriving after eight years and they've recently renovated a new location. I'm Jeremy Eaton and I'm going to take you inside the Max coming up.
Voters in Windsor Lake go to the polls on Thursday, September the 20th, about a year before the rest of us. Some issues in the district are issues for us all. The candidates have accepted a here and now invitation for a by-election debate. This is a critical by-election. When the opportunity comes up, you step up. Young people are worried about their future in this province. Our troubled economy, an aging population, muskrat falls and other big issues. The Windsor Lake by-election debate Thursday, September the 6th on Here and Now, also on Facebook Live and our YouTube channel. Arts, fitness and wellness all under one roof. A locally owned and operated company is growing. The Max has been around for more than eight years and it recently opened up a renovated building in Mount Pearl. I stopped by to learn how the business came to be and if the Max will continue to multiply. We're standing here in our newly renovated Max Mount Pearl facility. We're here in our, uh, in our fitness center. So this is our open training space. Uh, it's a it's one of two things we do in our fitness business, which also includes a lot of group training. So we'll, uh, we'll see later our fitness training studios. How long has the Max been on the go and open here in and around St. John's, Mount Pearl and Paradise? We've been operating for eight years and over those eight years we've increasingly added new locations. We have three main locations, um, but we've added more spots over those eight years just to get closer to families and individuals so they can uh, experience our programs. I've uh, heard some people say that the Max is sort of a mainland chain, mm -hmm. but that's actually not true. Where was, where was this company started? Who started this? Uh, it's a great story, actually. Our, uh, the Max company started on the sidelines of, uh, of children programming. Our two founders, uh, Mark Dobbin and Tom Williams, uh, successful businessmen here locally, they, they're parents, uh, and they experience what so many parents experience, of just getting their children to all of their activities on time um, uh, and to the right location. So they said, you know, there has to be a better way to do this. And how has the business grown from eight years ago to what it is today? Like, how many locations are there? Uh, currently, there's eight. Uh, the business has grown tremendously, including over the, uh, the past couple of years, where we've really honed in what we deliver for people and families. Um, so the growth has been strong. So as a local small business, we're, uh, we're pleased with where things are going. <laughs> You offer a summer camp program, but you also offer a after-school program that has a little bit of a unique twist that we normally don't see around here. Can you talk a little bit about that aspect? Yeah, our, uh, our mantra in after-school is play the healthy way. So every afternoon, for all of our children, they are physically active. So they do two activities every afternoon. They're always new and fresh. Um, so it just gets children, uh, just gets them moving and having fun. I've been around town and I've seen a few uh, Max minivans, Max sort of cargo vans. Uh, what are they for? What are you using those vans for? So we, uh, our after school program, we pick up the children every afternoon. So we pick up from over 20 schools. We have our own fleet of buses, some as big as 72 passenger all the way down to 13 passenger. So it's a big part of our business, but it's also a big advantage. Uh, parents want that convenience of having their children picked up safely from their school uh, and brought back to Max and, and run through the activities that we run them through. Yeah, this is our group training studio. So this is mainly used by our fitness program. Uh, group training is really our specialty, is what separates us. So our uh, trainers, like, uh, like Nicole, um, they come in here and they set up a workout just for you uh, and, and a group of people and guide you through that, uh, put on great music and time you and uh, give you a lot of instruction on the, on the movements. How many sort of different classes are offered at the Max, whether at this location or the other ones? Uh, in, a, in our fitness program, we have over 100 every week. So there are uh, you know, strength style classes that we'll have in a studio such as this. We also have spin and yoga, and they're offered morning, noon, and night, which uh, works for our clientele, which tends to be professional, so they come in here around around their work schedule. And what's also great at a, at a company like Max, which where we think we're really unique, is while you're doing a fitness class, your child can take a dance class or get a music lesson just outside the door, uh, which uh, is a great advantage for, for us. The company is eight years old. Mm -hmm. This is we're standing in your your newly renovated facility here in Mount Pearl. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans for expansion for the Max? Will you continue to grow? Do you hope? We'd certainly like to. We think one of the great pieces about this newly renovated building is we're really close to what a building should look like. Um, so to have the opportunity to build a new one uh, perfectly uh, to suit our business, I think, is a, is an exciting prospect. So absolutely, yeah, we'd like to uh, grow in the future. 
He was a special Olympian who had a special place in his heart for keeping Grand Falls Windsor clean and beautiful. Billy Ballard has passed away. A fix of everything, boy. Huh? Yeah. Make the place clean, huh? Ballard was famous for his bike and cart. He started picking up garbage and recyclables before people could actually return bottles and cans to a depot. He was a fixture in the town of Grand Falls, Windsor, regularly seen combing the streets and zipping around the rink during recreational skates. This past May, Ballard was given the Mayor's Award for his dedication to the community. Ballard was 75. Not a day that goes by that I don't receive notification of people not showing up for diagnostic imaging appointments, specialist appointments. How should clinic clinics deal with patients who skip their appointments? How about firing the patients? We'll explain. And? Public schools start later this week, but private schools in St. John's are already open and back to school. That's coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, thousands of students in the English School District are getting ready tonight to head back to school tomorrow. It's a big week. One private school in St. John's opened its doors today as it gets ready for this year's students, as well as celebrations of its 25th anniversary. I headed over to Lake Crest Independent School to take in some of the excitement on day one of the new school year. How, are you? Good. how, was, uh, how was the first day back at school? Great. What did you do today? I'm making a crown, I'm playing around. What's the best thing about coming back to school? Um, getting to see all the teachers and all your friends after having a pretty long summer. And what are you looking forward to most this year? Um, getting to know the teachers a little bit better, hanging out with my friends, learning a few more things. So how has day one back to school been? Uh, it was wonderful. Why wonderful? Because it's super fun at school. So what did you do today? So we learned about the weather and we learned about patience and we had snack and lunch and it was super fun. That's a pretty busy day one. Yep. You think the whole school year is going to be that busy every single day? Yeah. You seem awfully happy about that. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you've been waiting to come back to school all summer? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, and what do you like most about coming back? Because I get to see new teachers and I'm in a new grade and it's very fun. Um, it's calm. Calm? Yeah. You call this calm? 
Except for the end, like, in the classrooms it's calm. Well, in my classroom at least. Oh, uh, it was pretty cool. Well, first thing we did, well, we did math, and then we talked to our teacher. Like, the first thing we did, like, she always talks to us about, like, for, like, five minutes, and then after we do some math, and then, well, it's a pretty good day. So you like math, obviously. Yeah. The most challenging thing about day one, I would have to say, is to make sure that all the students are prepared to start school. So getting their schedules ready and helping them to kind of readjust to life back at school and get ready to follow all the new routines and the expectations of their new grade and the new school year. A lot of excitement uh, talking to these kids. Absolutely. The kids are so excited about being back here today. It's, it's, it's just amazing. So you got to make that last the whole year long. That's our hope, especially this year. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary year, so we have lots of celebrations plan for the rest of the year we basically like inter introduced ourselves and stuff like that you know we read a book then we went to the assembly it's all coming back to you right and then we went to gym then we had snack then what was your favorite part today the snack well, probably going outside. Okay. It's a nice day out there. Where? So how was day one? Um, it was really good. What did you like about it? Well, our teacher gave us coloring sheets and stuff to do so she could find out what we're like and stuff. Okay, and what are you guys like? Um, good. You're all good? I think. It's only day one though, right? Yeah. That could change. I guess so. But probably won't. You guys all seem like pretty good guys. Yep. Well, good luck this year. Thanks. It was really good. It was really fun. And we did a lot of math, which I really like math. So that's good. So you're happy because you got to do a lot of math on the first day back at school? Yes. OK. Why do you like math so much? I don't know. I just really do. It's, yeah, well, yeah I really like math. I don't know why. Two. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Those kids were a lot more excited than I ever was about going math? back to school. Oh, geez, oh. about going back to school. I, I failed high school math, but don't don't, don't say that. Oh, sorry. School is great. That's learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, most other schools start tomorrow, and uh, we want to showcase it. Mm -hmm. Send us your back to school photos and videos, and we're going to feature as many of those as we can on tomorrow's here and now. So send those tomorrow as you get back to school. <laughs> so, so write us an email to this address hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca. Or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at CBCNL. You may think going to the doctor means waiting to get an appointment, but some clinics say their biggest problem, waiting for no-show patients. Yeah, Nova Scotia, one doctor's office is pushing back against people who skip their appointments. Carolyn Ray reports. We've all heard it before, complaints that it takes too long to get in to see a doctor if you have one at all. But here at the Duffus Health Centre, they say there's two sides to that story. More and more patients are skipping their appointments. This month, there were 118 no-shows. That in, in hours equated to 41 and a half hours worth of clinician time, which is in fact like one full-time physician week of no-shows in the month of August alone. The doctor has heard every excuse, transportation issues, work delays, the weather, including snow, rain, and sunny days. I'm gonna point out that of those 118 no-shows, Five of them were people that had never been seen. They were new patients to the clinic. The clinic is so fed up, it's posting the numbers every month. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't receive notification of people not showing up for diagnostic imaging appointments, specialist appointments. The amount of time and, and resources that is spent for these people, and then they just don't show up. And, you know, and then they wonder what's wrong with their health. Well, that's why. And then there's other people who are in desperate need of being seen, and they aren't. As the manager, Angela Smith, now writes letters to the worst offenders, letting them know that by skipping appointments, they're causing longer wait times. When you hear it on the news all the time, people are always crapping on the government, they're crapping on the doctors. Um, the patients have to take responsibility. People have to be more accountable for their own health, um, and they have to start recognizing that the, they're part of the problem. 
Those who skip are paying the price. The clinic is now cutting off anyone who has three strikes, forcing them to go to the bottom of the province's wait list that is now nearly 55,000 names long. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, Halifax. I feel pretty good because we got something done, achieved something, built some stuff. Firing up a future. How a welding program is working in Cambridge Bay. That's coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. So here's the latest video from the Manolis L cleanup in Notre Dame Bay. It shows how the cleanup crew is removing oil from inside the ship. Yeah, the Coast Guard says that a tapping tool has penetrated the hull. This in order to gain access to a tank so that it can then pump the oil and the water mixture to a storage container that's on a ship above. Oh, pretty neat. We told you on Friday that even though it's been less than a month of cleanup, officials say most of the oil has been removed already. The ship sank near Change Islands in 1985 with an estimated 150,000 liters of oil on board. It's yeah. pretty cool. That is cool footage. There? It must have one of yeah. those, like, um, I don't know what it's called. It's an underwater robot with a, like, a fancy camera on it. And it ROV type thing? Yeah, certainly. I've seen them used it before. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Definitely great shots. Better late than never, too. Mm -hmm. We're waiting a long time to get that yeah. out. So it's good to hear it's, above, it's ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. good. Yeah. All right, well, it's weather time, long range forecast, but going to start with the temperatures right now. Uh, current temperatures uh, in the province, 18 degrees at the moment in St. John. So it's still a fairly warm evening uh, on the island, cooling down quickly, uh, though in parts of Labrador tonight. So we do have this system uh, that's affecting the Avalon uh, right now, but that should be clearing up fairly soon over the next few hours, really. And then we're looking at a clear evening for the island. A few little showers for the western portion of Labrador and the eastern portion, but that is also clearing off uh, by the morning. So then we're looking at uh, a 
pretty clear day. Some uh, cloud cover moving in later in the afternoon for Western Labrador and then some showers a little bit later. But for the daytime, we're looking at temperatures on the island between 16 and 20 degrees. But it is going to be pretty cool to start because we do have those northwesterly winds. So it should be warming up later in the afternoon. But lots of sunshine to enjoy tomorrow. For Labrador, northwesterly winds there for the eastern portion, northwesterly as well as well for the western portion of Labrador, but changing over to southwesterlies uh, later in the afternoon. So this is a system that will be moving through Labrador really overnight uh, Wednesday into Thursday morning. So you can see most of Labrador will be affected uh, by that. And then by Thursday afternoon, western uh, Newfoundland should see some showers and could also see some showers in central areas and uh, later in the evening for the east. But we're looking at some pretty decent temperatures on Thursday. You can see the change in the wind direction there. So temperatures between 19 and 21 degrees on the island. For Labrador, a bit cooler, 11 degrees in the west, 15 in the east. So as we head into Friday, things are pretty clear on the island and for eastern Labrador. But we do have some showers moving in for western Labrador and temperatures staying chilly there 7 degrees as the high on Friday afternoon on the island. We're still staying in that upper teens uh, as we head into the weekend and a mix of sun and cloud for everyone. So not a whole lot of precipitation in the forecast for the next few days. And you can see Saturday and Sunday. It's a similar story in the east. Cooler temperatures in the mid teens though, so it's not going to be super hot. Things are definitely cooling down uh, as we uh, head into as we now are entered into September, as well for uh, central areas in the mid teens and for Western Newfoundland and very chilly overnight lows we can expect as well for Eastern Labrador. Some cloudy skies, a mix of sun and cloud on Sunday and 16 degrees there and for the long range for Western Labrador, lots of uh, showers and cloud in the forecast and temperatures really dipping down into the low teens. So that's your forecast. Jeremy, back to you. Yes, Carolyn, people boarding a shuttle in Calgary this week will notice something missing. A driver. The city is introducing an autonomous electric vehicle. It's a first for Canada. The CBC's Carolyn Dunn got on board early to get a first-hand look. Meet Ella, the electronic autonomous shuttle that hopes to be a driving force to the future of public transportation. This is really helping us explore what the future could look like. So how does, how does the city change? Uh, when we have autonomous vehicles. The project is a collaboration involving the brains and money from academia, industry and all three levels of government. The plan is to shuttle up to 12 passengers on a three and a half minute ride from the TELUS Spark Science Centre in Midtown Calgary to the zoo and back, all without a driver. How does it do that? Well, this tiny board receives signals from about 20 satellites orbiting Earth to navigate its path. Sort of like your car's GPS, but with a lot more accuracy. We use our high precision technology that navigates to about two centimeters of precision to uh, keep the track, keep the vehicle on its track. There's always a chance on any route of coming across an obstacle, even people. Well, Ella has the ability to respond. Just like that. Ella is equipped with LiDAR. Pulses of laser light detect objects or people in its path. And if they come too close, the shuttle stops automatically. While there's no need for a driver, there will be an operator on board to help passengers feel at ease with the unfamiliar. I think it's something new uh, with all new technologies. Um, people tend to be a little bit critical. Um, and then also I think there's an element of, of losing control. So people like to be behind the wheel and in this you're letting something else take over. We want to make sure that the, the vehicle is operating in a safe condition and, and we have an operator on there to take care of the passenger safety. While this is a month-long pilot project only, it may be extended if it proves popular. Edmonton will launch its own Ella shuttle this fall and pilot projects are in the works for British Columbia and Ontario. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Love to see one of those in St. John's. Transforming junk from a scrap heap into works of art. That's what some teenagers in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, have been doing this summer. And as Alex Brockman reports, they're transforming more than just scrap metal. Keenan Alukpik sets to work with his welding torch as Michael Haniliak and Andrew Kittagon look on. A wolf's taking shape as the flames from the torch cut through the scrap metal. 
Carrie and Amanda Elebron oversee it all, shouting encouragement and advice. Take it away. Take it right away. Yeah. It's the fourth time the couple has come up to Cambridge Bay for the three-week welding course, a community where mentors are in short supply. Boys like to be challenged and they like to be pushed a little bit and they like to, you know, so we just got to, I just have to bring in what I know as a parent because that's all I really have. I'm not a teacher, I'm not a counsellor, I'm not a, any of those things. We just really have to work with uh, what we know as parents. Michael Haneliak is building up a stock of small birds. He plans to sell them to tourists. It's hard work, but he says it's worth it. I feel pretty good because we got something done, achieved something built some stuff. This all started with the town's heritage park, a group of old buildings being turned into a welcome area for tourists. This sculpture's in the middle, a musk ox representing Inuit culture facing down a pack of wolves. In 2016, the hamlet first approached the Yellowbrunts about creating it, but asked them to take the teens under their wing as part of the job. They've been coming back ever since. We like the cultural aspect of what it would, could represent and what it could mean to the boys at the same time. We like to uh, focus on giving young people like an identity and put them in touch with, with who they are so they feel powerful and they get, they get some confidence. At one point, the teens were singled out for getting into trouble. Officials in town thought things could get worse if they didn't have any guidance. Now that they have some, they're focused and doing good work. It's teaching us how to weld and other stuff, how to be good leaders, makes me feel great. Feels great, yeah. You feel proud? Yeah, I feel really proud. Yeah. The plan is for the teens to run their own weld shop, hopefully becoming mentors themselves, keeping up the work they've started and passing on what they've learned to others. Alex Brockman, CBC News, Cambridge Bay. Here's today's viewer photo of the day, and rather than playing the usual where in the province was this photo taken, mm -hmm. let's play another game. What do you see when you look at this photo? What shape do you see? Do you really want to dig into Jeremy Eads' psychology? <laughs> Psyche? <laughs> yes. Maybe that's not I'll the best idea. Anthony can answer this <laughs> yeah. one. A pot of gold, that's what I see. <laughs> There's definitely a rainbow, but uh, yeah, have a, have a little look and think it over. Well, now that we're into September, is it too soon to talk about Christmas? How about Christmas music? Uh-huh. <laughs>
Yeah, it's definitely too early. Now that's disco chart toppers Bonnie M. They're bringing their holiday music to Mile One Center yep. here and in St. John's. A lot of Debbie Cooper's hats apparently are coming <laughs> out. Uh, now, Bonnie M, believe it or not, is a German group behind Christmas classics like the one we're subjecting you to. A lot of fans. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sorry, I said Boney. I didn't even, sorry, we didn't even know, who, I didn't even know who they were. I didn't know who they were. Now that I hear the song, oh. though, I, I know them. I know the music. Yeah, well, kids, I remember Boney M. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for, it's yeah, the tour kicks off December 20th. A lot of people are very excited about that on the mm -hmm. internet. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Indeed they Anthony, are. Anthony, will, right, will, will I'm Wait. debating it. We were going to play <laughs> Rasputin, but then I'd have to subject you to this caustic dance, and you don't want you don't want to see that. You don't want to see that. All right. So, uh, oh. Sorry. Yeah. So how how's this for Atlantic Canadian Team Spirit? So, the blue team is from PEI, and Newfoundland and Labrador is wearing the black and white. And the PEI team has been doing the song and dance as a pregame ritual for most of the season, and Newfoundland, of course, and Labrador. Not too shy to join in. Ah, and that's uh, the Eastern Canadian Softball Championships. One way to ease some competitive tension before the game. Yeah, it's not a bad warm-up either. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> well, like, a bit of camaraderie. Yeah. So here's today's viewer photo of the day. Yeah. We were going to... So what do you see, Jeremy? Yeah, let's get back to this. was taken in Happy Valley Goose Bay. I skipped ahead. But Beautiful. Yeah, I've been watching uh, most of the Sharknado movies, so I'm going to go with... Uh, <laughs> Those are terrible. They are terribly awesome. <laughs> so that, uh, to me, it looks like a shark or like a, a yeah. fish. <laughs> well, trying to eat the rainbow. <laughs> Rainbow-eating cloud monster. Yeah, uh, Rona Gerard-Wall said that to her it looked like a, a fish that was eating the rainbows. So. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Good night, everyone.